On today's show, we talk with Dickie Quintal and others about September 11th and the Plymouth 9-11 Memorial. Visit the Plymouth Public Library for the unveiling of the Herring Tribe Wampanoag coloring and resource book. Hear original work from the Plymouth Poetry Festival, chat with local businesses and organizations on pop-up, take a closer look at Plymouth Town governance, and talk about upcoming events in our South Shore towns. We're glad you're here. Let's get started. When the gorgeous blue of a New York City late summer sky literally turned to ashen clouds on September 11, 2001, our nation was plunged into a depth of shock and sorrow that hadn't been felt in generations. We went on the local scene to revisit that day and its impact on America's hometown. When I literally saw those towers start in the fall, um, I sat myself down to hold on and tears were coming out of my eyes. It was, a, it was a tough day for this country. It was more than a day. It was a tough time for us. So I decided, you know, how I would like to build a memorial. Everybody was great. Oh, so many people helped. We know there are many people out there who care a lot. We were just fortunate that somebody like Mr. Quintal had the means to, to go to that level to show that he felt he had to do something, he wanted to do something, and he, he did a great job. We actually had a procession um, when it was finished in the next anniversary. We started at North High School. And we went um, from North High School, we marched down the waterfront on Water Street and then to the memorial. But in, in that procession, uh, parade, if you will, we rented a big giant America. It was huge. And it was construction workers, employees from American Airlines and what have you. And um, it was really something. It was a proud moment for the town. It was very touching. I'm choking now, just thinking of it in front of me. When you walk up, there's two things that, you know, obviously strike you. Um, the piece of steel, it's, it's a pretty good sized piece of steel and it's thick and it looks strong, but it's twisted. The symbolic nature of that, that you can have something that strong that stood the test of time for as long as it did, but it only took a short period of time to take it down and through an act of man. And then on the other side of that, you have the memorial itself with all the names. You know, all those names. And not only do we just put the names on there, we put them down by event. In other words, if you were uh, 343 firefighters, you're all listed um, by the tower, if whichever one you were in. If you were in the airplane that went in Shanksville, it's all broke down on those um, granite slabs by each incident. But I'm proud because that was the first one in the United States to list everybody. They do a ceremony every year, as you know. It just gives an opportunity for people to come, albeit once a year, gather together and just have that remembrance and uh, let the community speak to the officers and the firefighters uh, who may otherwise not have the opportunity to do so. Well, it's very important to me because this is a uh, very um, sensitive experience in my life and to see people not forgetting it um, is huge and for me to be a part of it it's, it's it's overwhelming we have so many first responders that probably weren't even born then or you know don't remember and then you know I, I, my daughter's here today and she is 17 so she wasn't born yet it's really important that she knows what happened and how many people lost their lives and how many people helped but it's important as a country to come together today, too. Each of us in every community trying to do what we can. We can't let uh, the division that was attempted that day divide us going forward. And so today is also in a, a unity day. It's a day to say we're still together as one country, not just against this threat, but going forward for the benefit of our country. So I think there's many themes to today, but they're all central to what we are as Americans. They're there because they want to remember. They're there because they want to participate in the event and never forget. 
I, I'd want people to bring more people to that ceremony so that they can remember, they can have that emotional connection to the day and to the memorial. All in all, I'm just glad it's in Plymouth. I'm proud of it, and I want it for people to go and have a place where they could pray. That's really what it was. And it served its purpose, it still does. The Plymouth 9-11 Memorial is located at number one South Spooner Street in North Plymouth. Click your heels together three times and visit the Beale House in Kingston on October 28th and 29th for True Rep Theater's reimagined version of the beloved classic the Wizard of Oz. This imaginative and inclusive production features the talent and enthusiasm of members of our developmentally disabled community together with True Rep company members. Visit trureptheater.com to get your tickets. Everyone has a story, and every story matters. In this last installment of Pop Up on the Local Scene at the Plymouth Waterfront Festival, we hear from some of the voices that make up the fabric of our vibrant community. I'm with Nancy from Plymouth Recovery Center. Can you tell me a little bit about your organization? Yep, so I'm Nancy. I'm the Assistant Director at Plymouth Recovery Center. Um, we're a nonprofit located at 5 Main Street, Plymouth. Um, we are an open door walk-in resource center. So we place, we do uh, work search, we have computers, we have groups running all day. We do placement in a sober houses, detoxes, aftercare, goal planning, a little bit of everything. Um, can I ask like, what do you think the importance is of having an organization like yours in the community? So a lot of people I think now know who we are, but you know, there's addiction everywhere, right? So whether it's alcohol or drugs, and we're finding it's getting younger and younger. So having a center where somebody come in in a safe place where they can be safe and then be brave enough to be able to share in that space mm -hmm. and get help, you know, and then we can help navigate them through recovery. I love what you're doing for the community. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. it's very big what you're doing. And we gotta keep going. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yep. That's about it in a nutshell. <laughs> we have groups like, so we just retain more space for growing. Third floor we just took over. So we have now have groups um, after Labor Day, mm -hmm. we're gonna be running groups morning, uh, every night, and then upstairs at night. Can I ask you, what's the best thing you can do if you have someone in your life who has an addiction? What can you do for them? Uh, just keep telling them you love them. You got, you'll, you'll help them, but you won't enable them. You know what I mean? I just help them through the process, encourage them to get help. They might fall 20 times, five times, 100 times, but sooner or later, I hope they get it. I'm with Gary Maestas. It's so great to see you. It's been a while. Thank you, thank you. It's good to see you, and, and it's great to be here and a great day. So you're with Dream Ride today. Can you tell us a little bit about the organization? Yeah, so uh, back when in my days when I was a superintendent of schools here in Plymouth, I started this initiative called the Dream Ride. And we uh, put together this initiative to ride from Washington, D.C. all the way to Plymouth on bikes, right? And it was really a dream of mine to do it, but it was this whole idea of how do I encourage our students in Plymouth to, if they have a dream, to accomplish it. Not, don't just think about it, just make it happen. So came up with the concept, people supported it. We landed up doing Dream Ride 1, um, uh, stopped at schools from D.C. to Plymouth, and had assemblies and, you know, really encouraged kids to kind of follow their dream. Uh, then we did one in 2016, which was uh, a bigger team. And we stopped at more schools. We had a specialized bike, gave us bikes. Reebok gave us a ton of shoes. And oh, wow. every time we go to a school, we would do this rally. And just uh, every single kid in the school wrote down on a piece of paper what their life's dream was. And we would you know, pull it out out of a basket and we would read a dream. If we read the dream, you want a bike, a t-shirt or a pair of shoes. Oh, wow. So we did that to schools um, all over here in Plymouth. We did that. Um, and now we're, uh, we were supposed to do Dream Ride 3 for 2020, but it fell apart, right? Because of the pandemic. So now our organization has always been uh, behind the scenes. So we're kind of uh, here today at the Waterfront Festival raising money for a program called I Can Bike. 
And what it is, it's a, a program for uh, students with disabilities so they can actually ride a bike and they never have. So we, this organization comes into Plymouth and they uh, have volunteers come and we help kids that have never ridden a bike. We, we actually had um, one of our students was 35 and never ridden a bike. And two summers ago, uh, he left riding a bike. That's so incredible. so uh, we're raising money to fund that and then we're going to do a dream ride uh, in 2024 which is to raise awareness for kids health and but we're here at the waterfront festival raising that level of awareness trying to get people excited about the organization um, and it's kind of cool because my youngest son is now the president of the organization and it's it's kind of cool to see a younger generation take it yeah yeah so he'll probably stop by later and say hi but um, yeah it's kind of neat I'm with Sam and Tommy from 360 CPR. We meet again. It's so great to see you guys. Uh, we did an interview with Sam and they also taught us at PAC TV CPR, which was very exciting. So we're now certified. It's great to see you guys. What brings you here today? Well, uh, like you said, we, we do uh, CPR, first aid training. We sell uh, first aid equipment and AEDs and we're local in the community. And our goal is to get everybody in the community trained and know how to operate you know emergency equipment so this is our second year at the waterfront festival we had a great time last year and we just couldn't miss it why do you think everybody needs to be cpr certified yeah so we're both first responders in our local communities and we do respond to emergencies pretty much everywhere it could be at a place like the waterfront festival or at a local store where members of the public sort of are um, there's nothing better than when we're responding to an incident like that to sort of see a member of the public stepping in and rendering first aid, first aid and care to a, a victim of an emergency right then and there. So it's really motivating for us as responders to see the public out empowered to do so. So in addition to uh, emergency services, you also supply other services. What, what about that? So we also provide uh, rental services to the filming industry in Massachusetts. So it's really taken off over the last couple of years, uh, filming motion pictures, television shows, as well as commercials, just your standard commercials in the area. Um, so we rent production trailers, hair and makeup equipment and trailers to the production industry, tables, tents, everything you can think of. So we're really taking off in that industry as well. I'm with Sheila Vaughn. Sheila and I go way back uh, to beginning of the year when we did the Chamber Expo. Uh, Sheila's fantastic and she's going to tell us a little bit why she's here today with Cape Cod Community College. Yes, so I'm super excited to be here today. So Cape Cod Community College and West Barnesville, we're here today representing the school, talking about our amazing programs, over 80 programs, doing a little spin wheel, giving out some tchotchkes. But really, you know, we're here to talk about our new programs with the community colleges being free for over 20 five year olds so if you haven't gotten a degree and you you haven't gotten an associates yet and you're a Massachusetts resident and you over like I said over 25 fill out the FAFSA and the application free college which means free tuition free fees and free books so you have only to take two classes a semester and there you go a free associates degree in Massachusetts any of the 15 community colleges so happy to talk about it with students but we're here all day it's 10 to 6 we're um, really enjoying ourselves and again people can come down and talk about and see us and talk about community college and uh, a lot of alumni are out here too so rep representing so come on out so for the free program, uh, how, what are the initial steps someone can take? Where, what's the website they can go to? So you can go to capecod.edu slash free, and it talks all about what the requirements are and how you can apply. Really, super easy. really great program. That's super exciting for Massachusetts. We really are excited, and I think it's going to make people really be able to go to school and really get their degree now. And, you know, I think for people that really stopped and started or just want to get started, this is the way to go. I'm with Colette O'Connor. We actually interviewed you at the Porch Festival last year. It's so great to see you again. I, I Apparently, I love Plymouth so much <laughs> that I just can't stay away from all the cool events that go on at the community. Yes, today we're at the Waterfront Festival slash Porch Fest because it's both combined. So um, looking around this morning, it's already so full and beautiful, people from all over the place. And um, and it, I just, I, I can't, I'm overwhelmed with how perfect a spot we have set up right down here by Plymouth Rock. And we're performing music and talking to people as they, you know, enjoy their day. So it's two things today. On top of everything else you got going on, there's Port Fest. Love it. I love it. Is this your first year at the Waterfront? No, I've been to the Waterfront Festival before. I used to come with the Hunger Bus. There was a big Chakula and the Hunger Bus. I used to pull right down there and we would raise um, foodstuffs for the homeless or the people that were in need. So um, that was, that was, it's always been great fun. I've been coming to this thing since I was little, little, little. Aww. Used to slide down that big hill. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's the, the free range kids were avail, around, allowed to have cuts and scrapes. Yeah, <laughs> we did that. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Can you tell us a little bit about your music? My music is singer songwriter. So um, what what I do, my mission is to um, help help adults learn how to reconnect to their breathing, how to how to relax, how to um, go for their dreams, no matter what your age is. So it's good for kids, good for adults, good for digestion. <laughs> My music is so chill singer-songwriter, it's incredible, but I did write a special song today about Plymouth Rock, so I'm excited to be here to do that. So what kind of events do you have coming up? Um, so the Plymouth uh, has a music festival coming up on September 9th at the, at the big library. So I'm doing that festival uh, coming up and uh, always, oh, you know, always great to do things in Plymouth. I did a lot of Sea Plymouth this year at First Friday. Right. So, oh, Plymouth, America's hometown is now my favorite front porch. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Colette, it was so great seeing you today. Thank you for stopping by. Always. Watch PAC TV, people. It's essential for community development. Thank you. With the seasonal chill in the air comes concerns for heating costs. The South Shore Community Action Council Home Energy Assistance Program can help you pay for your home's primary heating source, depending on income eligibility. This program runs from November 1st through April 30th, and renewal applications are currently being mailed out. If you're a Pembroke senior who would like assistance with your renewal, or new application, please call Marie at the Pembroke COA to book a Monday or Wednesday appointment. Special appointment times may be considered if needed. You can reach Marie by calling 781-294-8220. Here's Julie Thompson with a closer look at the municipality of Plymouth. Solar power is one of the fastest growing sources of electricity and is at the forefront of the move towards renewable energy. But solar arrays generally require large tracts of flat, wide open land, and once they're installed, they can be visible from far away. In Plymouth, local bylaws require developers to notify homeowners of any plans to install solar arrays within 300 feet of their property. But some residents feel that that still isn't enough. That's why a citizen's petition was created to increase the notification area to 700 feet. The petition received the endorsement of the select board last month and went to a vote at the October 21st town meeting. Replays of town meeting can be seen on pactv.org. And solar isn't the only type of power that Plymouth residents are talking about. Ever since the closing of the Pilgrim Power Plant in 2019, how to dispose of the over 1 million tons of wastewater left over has been an ongoing issue. Over the past year, Holtec International, the company who's in charge of decommissioning the plant, has installed submersible heaters in the reactor, which they say is part of an effort to help dry out the solid waste at the plant and help heat the facility during colder months. Environmental advocacy group Cape Down Winders says that the heaters were put in part of an effort to evaporate the wastewater after state regulators prevented the company from dumping it into Cape Cod Bay. You can follow all the developments in the decommissioning of the Pilgrim Power Plant by turning into the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, which next airs on November 27th at 6.30 p.m. No matter how your electricity is generated, Paying for it is something we all must think about. With energy costs on the rise in recent years, many communities like Plymouth have turned to municipal aggregation as a way of keeping their residents' bills under control. Under municipal aggregation, towns work with a consultant to buy energy in bulk, which offers savings over market rates. Plymouth's agreement is handled by Colonial Power Group, and residents are automatically enrolled in the program with the choice to opt out at any time. This has been a closer look at some of the municipal happenings in Plymouth. The Sour Not Sorry Brewery in downtown Plymouth is the venue for November 2nd's Underground Vinyl Record Collectors Night, happening from 6 to 9 p.m. Tap into your vinyl fantasy with a night of music, craft beer, and records. This event will feature a diverse group of record dealers showcasing a vast array of vinyl, spanning music genres, eras, and popularity. Admission to this event presented by Inebriart is free. Vinyl vendors interested in space information can email inebriart at yahoo.com. Sour Not Sorry is serving delicious brews, but is not booking the spaces. To learn more, visit the Eventbrite page.
The Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe is a resilient community who have lived on the lands of this area for thousands of years. Community Art Collaborative, the Plymouth Public Library, and the Herring Pond tribe together created a coloring book and resource guide to help educate all children about the important story and heritage of this indigenous tribe. We went on the local scene to the Plymouth Public Library for the unveiling of this incredible work. Flowers and other wildlife that leave during the winter. What are we doing here today? We are launching the Herring Pond Coloring and Resource Guide for children who are K through, I don't know, 92. Interesting stories to share. Some are shared at family gatherings and some have been written. The coloring book is the story of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. It, it is their stories, their histories. It is designed to help educate and inform the people of Plymouth, but also the surrounding counties and hopefully the country. So the relationship with the CAC and the Heron Pond Wampanoag tribe came about um, a couple of years ago when we did a partnership with Plymouth Public Schools and we had a camp, a four day camp um, through our Diners Path with um, about six students um, and Heron Pond members in the CAC. The Community Art Collaborative was founded to create and tell stories that we don't always hear. And it occurred to McLena and I as we started to create friendships and relationships with this beautiful tribe that their story was not one that had been told as well as it should be. And that our children were growing up and not understanding the part an important part that Indigenous peoples play in our communities today. I think as Indigenous people, and I think particularly for Herring Pond, um, we were always in history written as very autonomous, but um, we can't confuse autonomy with extinction because we're obviously not extinct. So speaking out and sharing our story is never more important. Um, our autonomy over the years, unfortunately, you know, in some ways I always say our silence will perpetuate our erasure. And it's really critical that we not only share our history, I mean, how important is the history of that little tribe and the, you know, at the center and the ground zero of colonization than to um, share that history with the town. We're often under, um, under. I guess, uh, I, I guess um, we, we feel invisible often in the story. Of course, you know, we're part of the greater Wampanoag Nation. Um, we know it was a 62, um, uh, 60 plus um, loose confederation of many different tribes, but the Herring Pond people have, you know, been written in the records and um, since the early 15th century when these things were being documented and until today and we trace our descendants back to those times in Plymouth, in Manomet, in Cedarville, in Borndale and I mean what it, it's critical that we share especially in Plymouth and Bourne and then you know Barnstable and Plymouth counties in, in southern New England I mean it really is so uh, we have to share the story. Kids are big sponges. They'll learn from whatever you put in front of them. So just having this in front of them, having them get this exposure is going to be great because they're going to learn so much more about the Herring Tribe than they knew before. I learned how you can make berries into paint. What you have to do is you have to squish the berries and then you paint with them and it makes paint. Because you use the juice like from the berries. The coloring book is broken into three sections. The first section of the coloring book talks about the change of seasons. Did you know that the Herring Pond tribe celebrates the beginning of the year in the spring? I didn't know until we started working on this coloring book. It also goes into folklore and stories that are shared. And then the last section of the coloring book talks about arts and crafts. The coloring book is all about education. So for a very long time, we have lots of education about um, pilgrims and how they fit into Plymouth. So it was great to have something where it's 
the Herring Pond Tribe and how they fit into Plymouth and the history of Plymouth and just kind of teaching kids of all ages. Well, I think a, a lot of the work that we do now is to reconnect our, our youth and our elders and all of our membership back to the, the, the traditional times. And, you know, we, we may lose sight of those things in this, you know, modern world that we live in with the modern tools. And it's critical and, uh, to teach them uh, and show them in this visual learning and that is this coloring book about their culture and about some Harry of the traditions. Wolfenog artist Quincy Harding is an artist and she created the design in our own coloring book. I want it to be something that they are proud of, that they can relate to, that they are proud to show, you know, family and friends about their culture. I also think, you know, I want them to learn about it as well. And I think even, you know, as an artist too, like obviously all kids like coloring books, but being able to like color it in, show people, and even like hang it up on the fridge, like show your friends. I think that's something that will make other kids interested, help them learn and, you know, overall hopefully build the community even bigger. Storytelling comes in all kinds of forms. And when you pair storytelling in a coloring book, you're now interacting with that. Not only the person who's coloring the book, but the parent or the guardian or family member who's reading it. Now everybody's sharing in, learning these new stories about this very vibrant and rich culture. Their longevity in the community and their livelihood, which we don't really know a lot about at times. We did not learn a lot about it in school, and it is our hope that if we provide this to young people, that it'll be more part of the fabric of what we learn every day. I learned about how no North America, people like to say Turtle Island because it, it kind of shapes like a turtle. It was important to tell the history of um, the Heron Pond Wampanoag culture to our children um, that are Native and non-Native children because unfortunately our story has been um, diminished and a lot of people don't know about it. So for us to let people know around Plymouth and other areas that we're still here um, is very important to us. I have a, a, an 11 year old granddaughter and I think her, you know, when she was about six, she had done, a, she had watched a presentation and, and we were included in it. And I, I said to her, you know, when you talk about it in school and, and does it does it make you feel happy or does it does, what do you feel? You know, and I was so fearful that she would say, oh, I'm embarrassed or, it, you know, it makes me feel awkward. And she said, oh, it makes me feel so important and special. So it really does build the their 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 morale to to be acknowledged and especially the coloring book. How fun is that? Right. It was important for us to co-collaborate with the tribe and tell their story and let them tell their story. We're so proud that Quincy Harding, who is a tribe member, illustrated the book. I think it was an honor to um, be asked to do the coloring book. I've been wanting to get more involved in the tribe, so I think this is really up my alley. I think um, the whole community is really great, and I think they um, them giving me this, this um, chance to kind of like sh do my part I think is really amazing <laughs> for my career and just um, to be more involved. These stories represent important, you know, conversations and parts of their culture that, you know, we've all learned from, you know, the Three Sisters Garden, wampum, uh, things of that nature. We just really wanted to get the word out and help people understand the beauty of what is right in front of them. And when you visit Plymouth, that there is the story of the people who colonized it, and there is the story of the people who resided here before and are still here now. It's critical and uh, to teach them uh, and show them in this visual learning and that is this coloring book about their culture and about some of the traditions. And it's just really amazing for them to see their history written, to see the, their, their name in, in, in print, talking about their nation and their people and our traditions that we have that are maybe different from others. Each tribe is unique in itself and it does give our youth really a sense of individuality and, and self, I feel.
Did you ever wake up and say, this is getting old? If you're alive, you're aging, and adjusting to that reality can feel different for all of us. Embracing aging and focusing on the positive aspects of growing wiser is the subject of an eight-week series hosted by the Plymouth Center for Active Living on Wednesdays, beginning October 25th. Facilitated by Marilyn Levine and Myra Glansberg, this class will explore resilience, transformation, accomplishments, dealing with loss and adjustment, fulfillment and relationships. The class is free, but registration is required and space is limited. Call PCAL at 508-830-4233 to register. The nostalgic setting of a 1950s summer camp sets the scene for the Pembroke Public Library's November 13th movie matinee of Wes Anderson's 2023 retro futuristic film, Asteroid City. Starring Scarlett Johansson and Jason Schwartzman, the movie follows a grieving father and his tech-loving children to a stargazing convention set in a small rural landscape. This astronomically heartwarming matinee begins at 1.30 p.m. Get intergalactic on First Fridays at Blake Planetarium in Plymouth. Each month, a live planetarium program hosted by Steve Davies will feature visible planets, stars, and constellations in the current night sky. You'll learn how to use a star map and get your very own copy to take home with you. These 7 p.m. programs are most appropriate for ages 10 and up and make a great family night, date night, fun night out with friends, or solo when you feel like an out-of-this-world experience. Tickets are sold online only and parking is free. Visit the Eventbrite page for more details. Here is Sarah Lelyveld in a reading of her original work. Um, our next reader is Sarah, oh, I always get it, I'm gonna say it, Lelyveld. Um, good evening, everyone. All of the, good evening, everyone. All the poems have been amazing. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, it's great. Um, I'm going to read from a series of poems called About the Sea. And um, it's a series, a collection that I've been working on. So here we go. The Lightning. The squirrels danced in the trees. They leapt from branch to limb. Just struck down tree trunk, thick with bark. The creek was overfilled. Lightning had lasted for days. Just one more day, she told herself. Just one more day before the sun comes out again. The lightning had cracked the tree. The field was full of Queen Anne's lace and clover, daisies and dandelions. She slept in the cool grass under a willow tree, an old drooping one that dangled hot in the sun. The fire ants were out. Timing is everything, her father had said. She dreamt above the clouds. She dreamt she was flying above the buildings. Hopping on one rooftop after another, soaring weightless, built like Tinkerbell. The headlights of the cars and the windows of the buildings lit the sky in the middle of the night. Weightless, she remembered. Timing is everything. She woke up to the sound of a train with a long, drawn-out horn. Under the willow tree, she looked up through its branches, a map of veins like a highway. The sun came through the branches and made them twinkle like flickering lights, a type of lightning bolt. Oh, sweet Saraquel, she thought. Oh, sweet squirrel that nibbled on an acorn next to her now. It would be wonderful to be a bird, she thought. Her mind was mindless. She thought of reincarnation. It would be perfect to rise up anew. She wanted to be a hummingbird to take flight again, over and under and over and under. She sunk her, she sunk her head deep into the grass, deeper and deeper, rise, 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 until the faint drum of her mother's voice grew louder through the screen door, calling her in for lemonade. This next one is called The Mud Slicks at Low Tide. The mud slicks at low tide were a mood, thick gobs that smelled of fish, sulfur and clay, salt and wild seaweed, like fungus, moldy like left out fruit, 
yet it drew her closer to the shoreline, closer to feeling it in between her toes, thick squirts as she lifted her feet like a suction cup and then back to squirting with footprints. She saw the clam spout out water, then the dull drum sound hammering, beat, beat, the beat of children's footsteps coming from the ice cream truck. They ran past her. They held their ice cream in one hand and throwing a frisbee in the other, the wind picked up and the frisbee sailed the arc of movement around the wind until it fell on the sand at her feet. The child ran to her, she thought. You will never see him again. Just look out to a million stones, throw one in the water and watch it skip. You will never see him again. Heartache, like ice cold waves, the water drew away. It floated like foiled gold farther and farther away until she could not see it anymore. It will become as smooth as sea glass, she thought. She had high hopes for it. The child tapped her leg. Can I have the frisbee? The outline of the child's shadow in the sun startled her. She leaned down to pick it up. And she had almost forgotten the little thing at her foot, just outlined in light. My final poem tonight is going to be The Seagulls at the Parking Lot. The Seagulls at the Parking Lot. Turning, turning the pale gray spots, she sits in the car in the parking lot with the radio on, leaning back, picking a thin piece of skin from her finger, listening to a song, soft, loud, soft, loud, verse, chorus, verse, it sings. She sighs and takes a drag from the e-cigarette quietly, the puff is like a cloud of wind, smelling of cher cherry tobacco, going up. Turning, turning, the seagulls move around and around above the asphalt, it, as though it was a wave, white crested and salted. One dives down to pick up the French, French fry spread on the ground. Thank you very much. miss the Duxbury Free Library Sunday Arts and Culture Series presentation of the dulcet melodies of alt tragi Americana artist Anna May on November 12th from 2 to 4 p.m. As a pianist, yogi, teacher, and poet, Anna combines her experience and influence into her songwriting, exploring themes of both estrangement and connection with inspiration from artists like Billie Holiday, Neil Young, and Leonard Cohen. Anna May's performance is presented by the Friends of the Duxbury Free Library. Visit the website to register. And that is what's good and good to know on the local scene this week. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.